Argentinian fighter bombers on a deadly low-level mission. La verdad. The truth is that the altitude at the final stage was as low as, as low as your guts would let you. A British warship tasked with being the bait. They're on a collision course that could cost hundreds of lives and change the course of a war. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. The South Atlantic. The Falkland Islands. May the 25th, 1982. Britain and Argentina have been at war for 54 days. 0600 hours. HMS Coventry, a British Type 42 destroyer, is situated north of the Falklands. With her is the frigate Broadsword. Hands to action stations, hands to action stations. Assume NBCB state one condition Zulu. Hands to action stations, hands to action stations. Electronic warfare officer Chris Howe is monitoring Coventry's long-range radar. Skyhawk, one, three, zero. Two Argentinian jets are spotted. Whiskey, this is Alpha Whiskey. Hostiles, one, nine, nine, or two, zero, one. Or bearing two, zero, six, or 22 miles. So speed fast, strength two. The anti-aircraft missile operator is Eli Ellis. We picked up high-flying aircraft coming from the sound as there were bombing targets in the Falkland Sound and Bomb Alley. Bomb Alley, or San Carlos Water as it's properly known, is where British troop ships are currently offloading an invasion force. Captain David Hart Dyke and his ship's company have been tasked with protecting these British troops landing in the Falklands. And that means detecting and destroying Argentinian fighter bombers that are determined to smash the land invasion before a bridgehead is secured. Whiskey, this is Alpha Whiskey. Uh, hostiles, uh, 214208. Allocated uh, bird target, call sign Charlie. Sea Dart Alarm Aircraft 2002-2003. Sea Dart, the ship's anti aircraft guided missile, is primed. Four positions, air investigate, new unknown, bearing 212, 24 miles. Take them out. Eyes on the bridge. Whiskey, this is Birds Away. Hostile 2002 and 2003. Whiskey, this is Charlie Bird Splash, 2002. We were exceptionally confident, perhaps even overconfident. Morale was extremely high. Both sides know the next few days could determine the outcome of the war. I wanted them to see my determination, and I was sure I was fighting for a just cause. Even though we realised the odds were stacked against us, we were very cheerful, lots of humour and lots of confidence. 1,100 hours. Argentina, Santa Cruz province, Rio Gallegos Air Base. News of the hit is relayed to Captain Pablo Carbaggio of the 5th Air Brigade. 
he knew the pilot well. All of what we felt together creates a bond. You learn a tremendous amount about yourself and you become like brothers. The desire to fight and the pain of knowing that we could be about to die. The pilots try to relieve the tension while awaiting orders. We used to play the guitar, sing, and so on. A mission would give them the chance to avenge their friends. The mission was to attack two ships that were providing radar coverage. In fact, they were apparently responsible for shooting down Captain Garcia earlier that day. The pilots will head to Pebble Island and attempt to sink Coventry and Broadsword. Joining Cabaggio on the four-plane raid are pilots Carlos Rinque, Jorge Barrio Nuevo, and Mariano Velasco. These were the ones that had been fairly successful in previous operations that day. So the aim was to neutralize these units. I normally climbed into the aircraft full of fear. But that morning, I wasn't scared. The Argentinians are flying A-4B Skyhawk fighter bombers, old but still fast, maneuverable and highly effective. Twelve fifteen. On Coventry, Hart Dyke receives intelligence from a special forces team hidden somewhere in Argentina. Unwelcome visitors, sir. Lieutenant Commander Jamie Miller, an intelligence expert, is briefed on the news. We had a chilling little heads up west message from an SAS infiltration patrol giving us due warning that another raid had taken off. Thank you, Ewo. I think we were expecting this. The estimated attack time is one hour away. I knew it was going to get tougher, so I was very aware, very keyed up. Pretty exciting end of the day, one way or another. 12.45. Skyhawk bearing 270. Coventry's radar picks up Cabaggio's flight group, approximately 420 kilometers away. Unknown, not squawking in AFF, not conforming to airlines. That's track 199. DW confirmed Skyhawks bearing 270. All positions are AWO. Air threat warning red. Hostiles 5556, five, 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 so there was a greater chance they would be able to acquire and intercept us. The pilots fly low in an attempt to stay under enemy radar. So low that sea salt coats Caballo's cockpit. I couldn't see forward. I was going to kill myself. So I thought, what place is straight and level? The sea. So I went over the water, avoiding the island. I had to tilt my head and look through the side of the canopy. So I had my helmet leaning on the plexiglass. And the vibration was going through my head. 
While Cabaggio's pair of planes hugged the coastline, the other pair, led by Mariano Velasco, head east across the Falkland Islands before turning north towards their targets. Whiskey Alpha, this is Charlie, new unknown, now hostile, track 0557, course 097, speed fast, new unknown, now hostile. 12.55. The two pairs of Skyhawks go so low, Coventry's radar is unable to track them. We were blind to the Argentinian pilots flying low over land, and the first time we would ever know of an attack was when they broke land. Their CDOT missile is unable to get a lock. All eyes were looking at the radar screens in the ops room. All eyes on the upper deck were looking towards Pebble Island, waiting for these two pairs of two aircraft to come across and to get their feet wet. We know the raid is coming. We've seen it disappear over West Falkland. And it's a waiting game. You're very literally like a tennis pair about to strike a ball. Every pair of eyes totally ready. 1,300 eyes. Coventry's sea dart is still trying to get a lock on the fast approaching enemy. Then. Look out bearing green 90, possible two pairs of two aircraft, 20 miles bearing green 90, height zone. I saw both dots on the horizon, just two small dots far away. I said we won't get back from this one because we were totally exposed. 1320. We heard this almighty scream from a guy on the upper deck. Alarm aircraft visual, starboard battery, green three zero. Radar operators know they'll only have moments to acquire a lock. We were quiet in the ops room, looking at our missile systems, looking at the CDAR surveillance radar to see if we can acquire the targets. We could not. Starboard battery, take aircraft bearing a green 3-0. Four five. Commentary has to rely down. on a less high-tech defense. Her four and a half inch gun opens fire. Fire. The minute I saw them, they started shooting, but you knew that was coming. Shadowing Coventry, Broadsword is also tracking the fighter bombers. I thought, I'll blow up any minute now. But Broadsword doesn't fire her missiles either. The aircraft are just seconds away. I could see the water erupting with impacts, explosions in the air. Then the jets veer to port. They're heading to Broadsword. The altitude at the final stage was as low as... as low as your guts would let you. Thirteen twenty-one. One bomb bounces off the water and up through Broadsword's flight deck, taking out a helicopter. It continues, without exploding, into the sea. But just when both British ships think they've had a lucky escape... Alarm aircraft visual, starboard battery, green 90. Okay. 
I look, and in the distance I see the silhouette, the profile of both ships. I would say some 15 kilometers away, easily. A flight time of little more than a minute. 1321. Hey, whoa, they're turning for us. Hostiles, 5557, 5558, bearing 210, speed fast, straight two, height low. had a pair of aircraft obviously heading towards us fast at extremely low level, wave top height. Officer, watch Captain come to port, 030. Aircraft inbound, uh, bearing... Captain Hart Dyke orders a turn to port to give his sea dart missiles a better chance of locking on to the planes. But then... Contact from the northwest. And the last thing I remember was that my principal warfare officer telling me there's some aircraft to the northwest. Possibly under attack from two positions, Hart Dyke calls a course change to starboard to give his missiles the best chance against both potential threats. Officer watch, Captain, come hard right 140. Increase speed to 15 knots. This is Charlie Bird's of um, Hostile 5557. I briefly locked on to the lead aircraft. Sir, I've got a sea harrier. Do you want him? The British fighter could take down the Argentinian jets. So I thought, well, I've got luck on. Let's go with the sea dart. Take it with sea dart. 13.22 and 40 seconds. As I allocated my missile systems and pressed fire, We, we broke lock. I saw the missile go past, some 300 metres away to my right. It was the only sea dart I saw in the war, and it was really impressive. It looked like a rocket taken off to the moon. Sea dart left the launcher and went straight up in the air. The aircraft are now too close for Sea Dart to lock. All the ship's company have left to defend themselves are the deck gun and rifles. Stand two, stand two. Broadsword called the fact that you could engage the targets. The men of Coventry are expecting Broadsword to fire any second. Thirteen twenty-two and fifty-five seconds. And then I saw the surface of the water being puckered by cannon shells coming towards us. And then penetrating the hull beneath me. La trayectoria. My trajectory was right over the radar antenna, right before dropping my bombs. Brace, brace, brace! Brace, brace, brace! Everybody sensed, you know, that perhaps they'd lost the battle. puncture Coventry's hull. All the men can do is wait as the three bombs delay fuses run down. Damage control, wood engine room, bomb penetrated port side in engine. is knocked unconscious. This one came round, I was surrounded by thick, you know, suffocating smoke and people on fire. I was then resigned to the fact that I'm not going to survive this. The 
the recollection of the fact that you are about to die isn't a painful act. It's actually quite... Uh, it's peaceful. I was putting my arm out with my hand. My immediate thoughts were I was going to die. I wasn't going to make it out of that ship. And I saw pictures of my wife and my children, actually, then at that time. And I thought, no, I am going to get out. You know, you can sense it to sort of the death throes of the ship. You know, it suddenly becomes unstable. Thirteen forty-eight. The ship begins to list badly. Coventry is sinking. The men abandon ship. 261 survivors are dragged aboard broadsword, but 19 men have lost their lives. HMS Coventry slips beneath the waves. Now, by going deep into the tragic events of that day, we reveal how a pair of outdated fighter bombers were able to sink one of the British Navy's most technologically advanced ships. The Falklands War began on April the 2nd, 1982, when Argentinian troops invaded the tiny islands and claimed them for their own. The British sent a task force to reclaim them. In a long naval career, Rear Admiral Philip Wilcox commanded a Type 42 destroyer like the Coventry and served in the Falklands War. The primary air threat that faced the British Navy in the Falklands was manned aircraft dropping bombs. The Type 42 destroyer had been designed for a very specific role, to target high-flying Soviet bombers over the open seas of the North Atlantic with her Sea Dart missiles. The Sea Dart missile system was designed to be able to deal with medium-range, medium-level threats. It's ideal for targeting high-flying, distant Soviet bombers. But in the Falklands, the task force commander, Admiral Sandy Woodward, made Coventry utilize her long-range radar in a different way. As an air attack early warning system. Coventry was the only destroyer at that stage that the Admiral had for that anti-air warfare and early warning capability. After seven weeks of the conflict, British forces are in a position to land on the islands. Coventry's role is to keep watch for Argentinian planes heading towards the British troops landing at San Carlos. These landings are crucial to British hopes of regaining the islands. But they are vulnerable, and if Argentinian bombers hit them now, the ground troops could be wiped out. Coventry was providing air cover over the north part of West Falklands and to the north part of San Carlos. Coventry could provide early warning and, if required, shoot enemy jets down. So I was tied to a certain position fairly close to the land for good communication sake to keep the information going to the landing force, who in the end were going to land and, and win the war. But Coventry also has another deadlier role to play on May the 25th. One, two, three, She's been deliberately placed in a highly visible and vulnerable position just off the mainland in an attempt to attract Argentinian fighter bombers away from the British landing site to target her. There was a hope that there would be what could be called a missile trap, where aircraft could 
be attracted towards this target rather than the landings. Early in the day, Coventry has the first of her encounters. Two Argentinian jets flying at high altitude. CDART can hit targets up to 65 kilometers away at an altitude of over 30,000 feet. It locks onto targets with the help of two radars mounted on the ship. The long-range radar detects and tracks aircraft at a distance of up to 420 kilometers. It then passes that information to the more precise missile guidance radar, which directs the CDART missile to the target. The two Argentinian planes are returning from attacking the British landing force. To ensure they have enough fuel to return to their base in Argentina, they're flying at altitude where the air is thinner. Ideal conditions for a strike by CDART. Coventry was able to engage those targets because the, the aircraft were flying at sufficient height to allow the ship to form a track, to acquire the track, and carry out a successful sea dart engagement. Coventry appears to have the upper hand against the Argentinian threat. Eyes on the bridge! But the ship and its sea dart system have a major Achilles heel. The important point to remember is sea dart was not designed to deal with very fast, very low threats. It's a weakness that British commanders are aware of. All the exercises that had taken place had shown that the capability of the ships to be able to deal with low-level, fast-attack aircraft close into shore was severely limited. CDART works best when the radar has a clear line of sight to the target. Any landmass around the target creates radar clutter, rendering the aircraft almost invisible. Unfortunately, over West Falklands and East Falklands, uh, there's a great deal of high land uh, and some low valleys uh, in the blind arcs beyond the hills, and indeed a lot of small islands, all of which create a great deal of clutter on the radar picture. Worse for the men on Coventry. It's a weakness the Argentinians know about. The best method to elude a sea dart is low-level flying. And the pilots are looking to exploit that weakness. We tried always to comply with our low-level flight pattern, achieve a sea-skimming flying altitude as soon as possible to avoid detection. Sitting in the operations room of a Type 42 destroyer, it would be almost impossible for the operators to be is unable to achieve an effective acquisition with her CDAR missile system because of the short range concerned and the difficulty in forming a track on the targets to be able to then allow the CDAR missile system to acquire and fire a missile against them. With Coventry unable to defend herself, the job falls to HMS Broadsword and her short-range missile system. Seawolf should target and destroy the aircraft when they come within six and a half kilometers or 28 seconds of reaching the ships. But now, Seawolf's radar is having difficulty getting the lock. Her fire control radar is switching between the two aircraft because they are flying so close together. The planes are so close, the radar locks onto what it thinks is one single large threat. I had to maintain that formation, and that formation proved to be key to avoid the possibility of our section being shot down. As the planes separate, the targeting system tries to track this single large threat, as well as the two individual planes. And as a result, it causes confusion into the computer system that controls the Seawolf system. And effectively, the Seawolf system shuts down and has to be reset. Broadsword is effectively defenseless 
and an open target for the Skyhawks to attack. Amazingly, thanks to its weight and speed, the bomb passes straight through the ship. Although Broadsword has had a lucky escape, the tactic designed to protect both ships has been breached. It's put to the test again when a second pair of Skyhawks under Lieutenant Mariano Velasco break land. But this time, there's an added complication. With the Skyhawks approaching on the starboard side, Captain Hart Dyke is warned of another potentially hostile contact approaching the ship from astern, the ship's blind spot. Contact in the northwest. Roger P. Ray, north northwest. One of the challenges of the Type 42 destroyer is that it can't fire over the back end. So the captain has to maneuver the ship to maintain weapon arcs for both the fire control radars and the launcher. Officer, watch captain come hard right 140. Increase speed to 15 knots. A turn to starboard is the quickest way Hart Dyke can bring the threat from behind and the threat from the south into his weapons arc. Velasco's plane is 35 seconds away, eight kilometers from Coventry. It's almost too close, at the extreme edge of CDART's minimum range. This is Charlie Bird's firm, hostile 5557. So, as I was turning to head to the ships, it's not that I made a mistake, but I had to lift the plane a little. So, in that moment, when I lift a little to turn into them, Coventry radar locks onto me with a sea dart. But with the Skyhawk flying so low, the sea dart's radar has difficulty maintaining this lock. As Ellis presses the fire button, the target is lost. Coventry can't fire again in time. The aircraft are just 21 seconds away, and Coventry is depending once again on Broadsword. And of course, one's hope was that Broadsword would be able to take them. In the final critical seconds, Hart Dyke's Coventry continues her turn to starboard to counter the unknown threat from the north. Broadsword's radar homes in on the two planes. Broadsword achieves an acquisition on certainly one of the aircraft. But just as she achieves that acquisition, Coventry continues to turn to starboard and effectively cuts across the bow of Broadsword's potential engagement against the targets approaching now from towards the southeast. Coventry now sits between Broadsword and the approaching enemy. If Broadsword fires, her missiles will hit Coventry. The enemy aircraft are left unchallenged. And Coventry's starboard turn has another consequence. It places the ship beam on to the planes, the worst position possible. When you've got aircraft attacking you on your beam, they have got a long length of the ship to be able to attack. If you narrow the angle, then any misjudgment by the pilot means the bombs are gonna land, land on either side of you. When Velasco drops his three bombs, Coventry is still turning. Much of the target is exposed. Brace, brace, brace! Brace, brace, brace! Brace, brace, brace! The 
first bomb destroys the computer room, killing seven. The second fails to detonate. But the third kills ten in the engine room and surrounding compartments. Two more die during the evacuation. The Navy's plan has fallen apart. Now, having investigated never-before-heard testimony from those involved in the attack, we can reveal the chain of events that led to the deaths of 19 sailors and the loss of HMS Coventry. May the 21st, four days to disaster. HMS Coventry and Broadsword are positioned just off the Falklands to tempt Argentinian jets into attacking them rather than the British landing force. May the 25th, three hours to disaster. Argentina's National Day. Concerned about the effectiveness of his ship in defending herself from direct attack, Captain Hart Dyke drafts a signal to the task force commander asking permission to move Coventry into open water. I actually had my ops officer drafting a signal. I needed to draft a message to the... I didn't get around to seeing the draft, and the signal never went, because events overtook me. 38 minutes to disaster. Coventry receives warning of incoming enemy aircraft. Now hostile, track 0557, course 097, speed fast, new unknown, now hostile. Radar contact is lost as the Argentinians go low over the islands. One minute, 38 seconds to disaster. A pair of jets attack the two ships. They break the defense and score a direct hit on broadsword. The bomb fails to detonate. Alarm aircraft visual, starboard battery, green 90. Seconds later, another pair of fighter bombers are spotted approaching from the south. 40 seconds to disaster. Hart Dyke is warned of more aircraft in the northwest. Roger Piro, north, northwest. He orders a turn to starboard to keep both threats in his weapons arc. Officer watch captain come hard right, 140. 33 seconds to disaster. Coventry's sea dart gets a lock on the second wave of jets. Take it with sea dart. It's fired, but misses. The defense of both ships now falls to broadsword. But there's a problem. The combined missile defense tactic will only work by carefully coordinating the two ships' movements. The first time they had to practice this relationship between the two of them was when they arrived here, north of West Falkland. We had about two or three days, I think, towards the end. 23 seconds to disaster. Broadsword Sea Wolf missiles track the jets. But in the heat of battle and with no opportunity to practice, communications between the two ships break down. Coventry turns to starboard, but so does Broadsword, resulting in Coventry breaking Sea Wolf's missile lock. Both ships are left helpless. Five seconds to disaster. <laughs> Velasco's three bombs rip through Coventry's port side.
19 sailors are killed, and one of the Royal Navy's most valuable assets is sunk. The unknown threat to the Northwest that forced Coventry into a starboard turn is never identified and never materializes. The decision to pair Coventry and Broadsword was made for good reasons. But in action measured in seconds, it proved impossible for the warships to communicate and maneuver together effectively. The feeling of knowing you've successfully completed your mission is subdued by the pain for the other. When you attack someone, you're attacking a human being. And that's something you carry around with you for the rest of your life. But by deliberately putting herself in harm's way, Coventry did achieve the role she had been asked to play, drawing Argentinian fighter bombers away from the British landing site and saving the lives of countless ground troops. When I heard from people afterwards, there was a Royal Marine, you know, who was sort of digging in ashore, having landed from the amphibious force. He said, thank God for Coventry, and if it wasn't Coventry, it would have been ours. So, in fact, it was a necessary sacrifice, you could say. You know, we enabled that landing force to consolidate ashore fight the winning battle, rather us than them.